Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Flint Community webinar on coronavirus, providing a local contact to a global pandemic. This is July 29th, week 124, and we're excited that you joined us today. This webinar is sponsored by the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center, the Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, and the Prevention Research Center. Today, we are excited about being able to be here with you and let you know that um, this day, we have had a number of partners to be with us, and I'm delighted to be here. Your moderator, Yvonne Lewis, the co-director of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. We've had a number of community partners that have joined us over the weeks, and they are still here working with us uh, to answer questions for you in the background. So we hope that you will be sure to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, today, we want to remind you that if you are not aware, this is Minority Health Aware Mental Health Awareness Month, the month of July, and uh, there is information that we'd like to share with you just briefly to just give you a little bit of background on that, that one in every uh, four, Af uh, excuse me, that one in every four African Americans suffer from the diagnosable mental disorder. Minority populations are less likely to be received those diagnoses for behavioral health issues and have less access to mental health services. And this is something that we're hoping to continue to address, particularly here in our community. We have resources that are available to you. Today, we have a very interesting program for you. We're excited. We're going to talk about something that many of us have not uh, talked about before, but perhaps even thought about COVID and Alzheimer's disease, uh, looking at how COVID may have been impacting the brain. This is something that we continue to learn about, but we're also going to talk about the Omicron variant, uh, the City of Flint news, as well as an update from the Genesee County Health Department. And today... We just want to let you know we do have some late breaking news, late breaking news uh, from the health department. Ashley Ervick is here with us. We were expecting to hear from uh, Dr. Hackert, but there's some information that's um, in process right now that we need to be given attention to. And so Ashley's going to give us a little bit of update on what's going on. Ashley. Yes, thank you for having me. So at this time, um, just a quick update for monkeypox virus or MPV, as you may see it abbreviated in um, healthcare transmissions from uh, CDC or MDHHS. Right now, the Genesee County Health Department is um, hitting the ground running with planning and preparations. Our main goal right now is to be proactive, not reactive. So what we're doing is we're having a lot of conversations multiple times a day on Right now we're working on making sure our healthcare providers who provide healthcare to patients that may be exposed or symptomatic with monkeypox virus also keep themselves safe. So um, for example, right now I'm actually delivering eye protection um, to one of our clinics just to make sure um, that they have all the PPE they need in order to safely assess and treat monkeypox virus if need be. Um, there is a lot of conversations for safety for our healthcare workers right now, those providing any healthcare or any, vote, any providers that may have exposure to patients who have questionable or confirmed monkeypox virus. Um, I got a notification to start my video. Sorry, it distracted me. I am on the road delivering some stuff, so sorry for my appearance. Um, so at this time, we are having those larger conversations across the entire organization. We're also working with staff to make sure that we are properly assessing and transferring phone calls in regard to individuals calling the health department regarding um, potential exposures or um, symptomatic individuals, where they need to go, who they need to talk to in order to get quick and efficient access to health care. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing right now. We have no confirmed cases of monkeypox virus that we are aware of at this time. Again, we are doing everything that we can to make sure that we are as proactive as possible to make sure that we are, we are assessing as needed. Right now, we are still continuing with our COVID vaccination sites. We have our three sites. Uh, that's gonna be Our Lady of Guadalupe, Central Church of the Nazarene, and Shiloh. They do alternate. 
Um, so may, uh, being cognizant of our calendar at this time, what week we're on, so you go to the appropriate site. We do have a couple of pop-up clinics. One has um, been confirmed for the Flint Farmers Market on the 2nd. We are waiting for confirmation on additional pop-up clinics from the location before we establish and publish those locations online. Um, please be mindful that you are looking at age parameters up. Right now, the Flint Farmers Market Clinic is all ages. Next slide. We still have our three community testing sites. Those are going to be our MDHHS right. honey sites. They do wrap oh, antigen and right PCR. Now. Okay, and PCR testing. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Just make it sure. Um, they do rapid antigen PCR testing. Um, they do it by using saliva or a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, just make sure that you know what you are in need of when you go to these testing sites so you know what to ask for. Next site or slide. These are um, our ongoing testing and vaccination sites that we are aware of within the community that is not with GCHD. It's gonna be our Walgreens, Hamilton Community Health Network and our Rite Aids. Um, definitely call before you go just to make sure that their guidelines and parameters for getting the testing or vaccination hasn't changed and you get there and you get the, the care that you need seamlessly. <laughs> if you need additional support at this time, if you have any questions or concerns about COVID-19 or in this case for monkeypox virus, you are welcome to contact us. Um, at the Genesee County Health Department. We do have a COVID call center that's 810-344-4800. If you have for some reason um, symptoms or feel like you have been exposed to the monkeypox virus, we do ask you to call our communicable disease line at 810-257-1017. Thank you so much, Ashley. Be safe out there <laughs> and continue oh, the good sure. Sure. Continue the good work that you're doing. Thank you. Our next presenter is going to be Irvin Vega, and uh, Heverlin is going to give us a more in-depth introduction of Dr. Vega. I would love to do that, Yvonne. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Vega, you should you should recognize the name. He was with us back in May, um, talking to us about genomic testing. We are excited to have him back once again. He actually has a new title. So Dr. Vega is the newly appointed Red Cedar Distinguished Faculty in the Department of Translational Neuroscience at Michigan State University. His work is out of Grand Rapids, but he does a ton of community engaged work out there. We are excited to have him come to Flint where he is going to share his work around Alzheimer's or um, the brain and COVID. So he's got some really great information. Make sure you get your questions in the Q&A as he's going through his, uh, his presentation. He'll be here to help answer those. Okay, so is, should I should go in on right now. Uh, oops. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I think I, oops, uh, that's not a presentation I have here. Uh, I'm so sorry. I might have sent you the wrong presentation, uh, uh, Heatherlon. That's, that's all right. This actually would be a really good way to give us a refresher on, you know, we've been talking about COVID for so very long. Um, but we haven't talked about what pandemics look like in recent history, like what you've got here, and then some other details about COVID. So I would I would encourage you to 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 just keep going with this one. Okay, okay. Um, okay, perfect. I, I think we can skip to some slides as, as we move forward. Uh, I apologize with that. I'm actually uh, talking to you from, from East Lansing right now. I was attending another meeting and I was calling. So I, you know, uh, I apologize for the uh, mess up here. Uh, I'm actually, uh, let me see. So, uh, 
try to get that presentation too from here so I can um, work on it. Um, so anyway, uh, as what this slide indicates is how, um, how different pandemics have uh, passed throughout the year, throughout, throughout our lifetime. Uh, this is not the first one. And, and unfortunately, we know it's not going to be the last one. And now, as you heard, we're talking about monkeypox and that has been detected in different countries. And it will actually uh, will be something that uh, will continue spreading and it's up to us to make the corrections in behavior so that we don't continue passing the, um, uh, this virus from one person to another person. But something that is important to, to also uh, point out in here is that uh, we have endured these pandemics in the past and we are actually now trying to uh, cope uh, with how these pandemics affects us in a more, in this context that I'm gonna to talk to you in a more, uh, taking in consideration more the health disparities and how uh, the long uh, effects that these uh, viruses can have. Next slide. So uh, specifically to SARS-CoV-2, I wanna use this image to remind you of the structure of coronaviruses. Uh, they receive their name because of their structure. It's a corona, uh, so that's why they call it coronaviruses. And in the SARS-CoV-2, have a specific information in the in its genetic material that distinguish uh, this coronavirus from other coronaviruses. Uh, it's not the only one. It's just have a specific changes in the genetic material that. Uh, make it distinct and it continue evolving to as people get infected it allowed to accumulate mutations in particularly that red protein that you see in the surface that is called the spike protein and the spike protein is actually the one used to enter the cells and it's actually the one that is neutralized uh, based on the uh, immunity that we develop after infection or more in a, in a stronger way once we get vaccinated. Next slide, please. Uh, can we go to the next one? Thank you. Uh, next one, sorry. <laughs> uh, just, yeah, just keep going to the next one. I will let you know, sorry about that. So that's that aspect of the testing. Uh, we go to this to to the process of detecting, and we talked before how we can detect and uh, distinguish uh, COVID nineteen, and it's because of the specific genetic material, and in that way we can determine that you have uh, COVID nineteen or you have the virus that, that actually causes COVID nineteen. Next slide. So just keep moving forward. Okay, so how the COVID-19 entered the cell. So the, the spike protein um, goes to the surface of the cell and actually interact with proteins in our cell. And that actually gives the key uh, to enter the cell. Uh, so that is like the, the, key, uh, the key and the lock kind of uh, analogy. Uh, so that opened the door into the cell where the viruses then replicate. Uh, we usually think that uh, this, this SARS-CoV-2 only affects uh, the cells of the uh, respiratory system. But we understand it now that this virus actually infects the epithelial cells, epithelial cells, and actually can even affect the neurons in the brain. So SARS-CoV-2 is actually the virus, but then when you get infected and you get more viruses, uh, next slide, just go forward. Uh, you can then develop COVID-19. And COVID-19 is actually uh, the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. So once is one, I want to make the distinction here of the virus versus the disease. And because some people uh, may get infected but don't show symptoms, so don't have the COVID-19 disease. Uh, but other people definitely develop the COVID-19 uh, disease. So in, in this slide, um, uh, what you can see is the 
the spectrum of, of the symptoms that COVID-19 has in the in in the individual. The most talk about is actually the aspects that affects in the upper respiratory system. But later is uh -huh. it talk about uh, the neurological effects that it has uh, that this SARS-CoV-2 has in our nervous system. It's like so. Um, what is the impact of COVID-19 in the uh -huh. brain on the brain? So one of the aspects is, and uh, people talk about, is the, um, uh, the loss of taste and the loss of smell. Um, and that is actually something that people start complaining uh, uh, in, 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 in many cases is something that, that lasts for a long time, something that goes and, and, um, and it, it can last for six, nine and people have been even uh, uh, after a year still experience it, even though that's rare, uh, it can last for even, even if you don't have upper respiratory system, you can still have that lack of smell or taste. One important aspect uh, that actually was the cause of many of the deaths associated with COVID-19 was the uh, cerebrovascular disease caused by coagulation uh, in the brain, uh, in, in arteries, veins, and capillaries of the brain that induce a stroke. And that actually was some, uh, most of the cases, especially when they reached the ICU, that uh, uh, the individuals uh, will suffer from a stroke and actually uh, in the worst case scenario, they, they die. In other cases, they have damage to the brain sufficient to have functional uh, problems, uh, such as a speak, uh, processing, cognitive function, et cetera. Uh, and that is uh, in the brain, in the, in the central nervous system, actually uh, associated with increased uh, uh, inflammation. Uh, it's actually a systemic inflammation of the brain caused by a stroke and also because of the lack of oxygen, uh, indirectly due to the lack of oxygen. Next slide. So this is an example of uh, a brain of an individual that suffer uh, the consequences of COVID-19. Uh, this is, this is uh, a, 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 we can think that it is an extreme case, but this one of the main causes of that, I will emphasize that of COVID-19 was when it gets to this level and especially people that reach ICU. On the left side, you can see a normal brain. That's how a, a normal brain should look like in an MRI. All those areas in the panel A that you see uh, white in color, those are called hyperintensities and it's water. It's water that gets into the brain due to the lesions. And that is actually uh, due to a stroke in many cases uh, in, 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 uh, and actually bleed into the brain. Uh, in B, uh, you see the damage that it causes to, um, uh, to the brain. It's supposed to don't look that where the arrows are. It doesn't, it doesn't it's supposed not to look uh, that way. As you can compare the left side where the arrows are with the right side, uh, um, that's the normal. Uh, so and then you can see the differences between the right and the left, where is the area most affected. And um, as you go in the MRI two layers, um, you can see the different damage that it causes uh, to the individual. And in this case, this is an unfortunate case that the individual uh, died. And what is in E, E, F, and G in the bottom is actually the histology done uh, post-mortem. And he's showing the blood vessels and how it goes an infiltration of peripheral immune cells that, can, that were detected using antibodies in, in F. In this case, the marker called uh, CD68. So you get this uh, through COVID, you get this uh, stroke, and then you get this inflammatory response that allow the um, immune system, the peripheral immune system to invade the brain and cause uh, uh, the damage that you're serving here. Next slide. 
So not only in the central nervous system, but also uh, the peripheral system, which means the connection between the nervous system and the muscles, for example. Uh, people uh, suffer after uh, having COVID-19 from a muscle pain and actually even muscle wasting, which means uh, deterioration or decomposition of the muscles. Uh, and that is very characteristic of individuals that are, have uh, diabetes and is called um, a neuropathic pain. Uh, and that is you feel like covering in your extremities and, and it becomes really, really uh, painful. Um, uh, that neurologic, uh, neurologic uh, uh, pain uh, can last for, um, uh, again, month after uh, the main uh, symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, that's the most common effects are for the central nervous system are uh, lack of, or insomnia, uh, problems with sleep, uh, extreme headaches, uh, you have a, a encephalopathy or actually inflammation of the brain, and you are a higher risk of stroke. And the peripheral system is the muscle, and then also problems with, with, with your vision, uh, your sense of smell, as I mentioned before, and your sense of taste. But there are other people on common uh, symptoms that suffer from uh, autoimmune disease. So your immune system, because it it, it was, you got all this information and invention, invention, it, in a invention of the peripheral immune system into uh, this, uh, the nervous system, which is a privileged site in our body. Now it start attacking uh, its own proteins and that is uh, inducing an autoimmune disease, meaning you are, your immune system is not recognizing your, your cells and it's attacking them. And that is what uh, uh, induces that pain in the muscles. Next slide. So what this is, a, what we know, I, and you can go forward one more, is that in Michigan and around the, uh, the nation, Blacks and Latinos are being more affected by COVID-19. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Latinos uh, and Black are also more affected by Alzheimer's disease at a more risk of Alzheimer's disease. And with these effects that I told you about the brain, now we have another risk factor uh, that it, it puts Latinos and Blacks at more, uh, more risk of developing neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Next slide. So, um, the disparity is that among Hispanics, uh, they have uh, they are 1.5 times more at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease than white, and blacks are twice as uh, at risk uh, uh, over white of developing Alzheimer's disease. So uh, again, I want to emphasize that now also with COVID-19, we actually are having these brain uh, lesions if we had the disease, um, the COVID-19. And now just because of other risk factors uh, uh, that are happening among Blacks and, and Latinos, uh, our COVID-19 now represent a new risk factor that put us at more risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and rare dementias. Next slide. So I, I want to use this slide to, to convey the message that uh, Blacks and Latinos are at higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and related dementia because of the social determinants of health. It's nothing, it's more of a social effect rather than a biological difference with other ethnic groups. Um, is how this uh, vicious cycle of contextual factors get into our education and access to healthcare, which actually put us uh, at risk. Next slide. Uh, and with this one, I, I gonna finish to open to questions and it's just to highlight the risk factors. So uh, at the top of the slide, you see the risk factors for uh, Alzheimer's disease, and in the bottom, you see the protective factors. So one of the aspects of um, risk factors is uh, 
obesity, hypertension, all about metabolic disorders, right? Uh, including diabetes. But there's also un unhealthy diet and, and lack of exercise and um, uh, the, the unhealthy diet, meaning increase uh, this uh, diet that uh, promote inflammation or promotes oxidative stress in our cells. Uh, and we know that these are actually um, uh, obesity and diabetes and hypertension, you have also heard that individuals with this uh, comorbidities have higher probability of having severe symptoms of COVID-19. And I just show you that COVID-19 has a direct effects in the brain. So in combination of this, now COVID-19 becomes a, an another risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Uh, what we can do to be uh, to reduce our risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, uh, even if we have COVID-19, is to change our behavior in terms of having a healthy life. Uh, a do exercise, have a very educated, a very um, a diet, and actually try to maintain our brain active uh, in, in creating something, either uh, finding a new sport, doing a new exercise, or uh, interacting with individuals, even though uh, we know that with the isolation uh, that uh, that created problems. Uh, it, uh, you know, isolation and it prevents the interaction with all the individuals. So it's actually we're trying to, even though you have COVID-19 and you have comorbidities, what you're trying is to maintain your numbers, uh, your hypertension, have a control, your diabetes control, uh, your obesity, try to uh, reduce weight and, and to exercise. And the most important, the social stress. We are living in a, a a stress out society. So we need to do something about it and to find a way to increase meditation, yoga, do things that I know our busy schedule doesn't, doesn't allow us to do. Um, and let's see next slide, please. Okay, uh, with that, uh, I, will, I will finish here and address any questions you may have. Dr. Vega, we are so glad that you have joined us and given us such important information. Um, a couple questions. Number one, what I'm hearing you when when you talk about different signs and symptoms of of Alzheimer's and dementia, and ways that we can mitigate or or you know prevent some of those risk factors, I'm hearing that you really say that we can do these behavioral changes at any point. So it's never too late to make these changes. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, I think uh, I instead of using the word prevention, I to say reduce. Risk. So you can reduce your risk by changing this behavior at any age. One of the misconceptions of Alzheimer's disease and rare dementia, people think that this is of old people. And if you are an old person, just you know, uh, be there and be have Alzheimer's disease, right? Uh, and it's that's not. I think. Any at any age, or exercising, having a better better diet, and better habits of sleep. Uh, we don't we value good sleep in our society, and during sleep, our brain flushes all the chemicals that we accumulate throughout the day, including uh, the molecules that process uh, or are the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. So. If we if we sleep, our brain rush that to our blood system and to the kidney, we throw that away. Uh, so a good sleep, uh, a good sleep habit would actually uh, be very beneficial for your for your health. Mm. That's something I hadn't even thought about. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Vega. There was one other th one other quick question: Is uh, can a mild case of COVID increase the risk of dementia or does it have to be a complication like a stroke? Excellent question. And, and the, the specific answer for that is, is under study right now. Uh, there are clinics that are called long COVID clinics that are following people with different levels of, of the disease, mild, moderate, and severe. And we are trying to assess that. Uh, uh, right now, we, we are not sure. Uh, some individuals, 
may have a severe case of COVID-19 and never develop Alzheimer's disease. And some individuals may have a mild case and, and, and be a combination with other comorbidities and have now a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. We don't know that. What we know is we are facing for a spike on Alzheimer's disease and or vascular dementia because of the effects on the brain and the biomarkers that can be detected in people with COVID-19 uh, that are the inflammation in the brain, which we know is a, is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So COVID-19 can be considered like a traumatic brain injury. It's like having a concussion to your brain. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's the way some people are starting to describe it. So, so here's another question, and thank you, Noah, for that question. And, and Donna asked a question: do, do the brain changes persist after COVID symptoms subside? And if so, uh, <clears throat> would this then lead to a long-term possibility of increased risking of stroke? Yes, and actually, there are people <clears throat> uh, cases reported of people having a stroke months after COVID nineteen. Uh, and the, the factor that people epidemiological studies are doing is that the risk factor for those stroke cases were that people had COVID-19 before. And to point out that once you damage an area of the brain, uh, the brain tries to repair because we have stem cells. But if the, the, the damage is severe, there's no way back. Uh, that's it. You, you go no have going then into therapy because the brain has a lot of plasticity and can find other ways to, to restore function. But the cells that you lost, they're lost forever. Yeah. Well, we have one other request from Aurora and is if possible that the presentation could be made in Spanish, made available in Spanish. And if so, I'm sure um, we can get that information to her. So Dr. Vega, we thank you for this information today. I'm sure that it leads us to more questions. <laughs> <laughs> and as you say, there will be more questions come because there is more study happening around this issue. So thank you for your presentation today. Thank you for your support in this, Heatherland. And, and now we want to just bring quickly our roundtable team because Dr. Vega, you said some things uh, and you pointed out in one of our, our comments, you re really made it clear that there are some really other factors that include the impact of these issues on black and brown people like the social determinants. So we're going to ask Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Wolford to join us in this round table. And you may also have some additional insights, Dr. Wolf, uh, Dr. Vega. Dr. Reynolds. Yes, thank you, Dr. Vega, because you touched on things that are near and dear to our conversation, and that is assessing risk and prevention. And we always have to be vigilant about these things. And as a pediatrician, I still say vaccination is the prevention for complications, hospitalization, and death, and, and sometimes infection from viruses and bacteria. So vaccination is most important, but when we start talking about risk, we need multiple layers of protection to uh, reduce our risk. And if someone would pull out the Swiss cheese again, uh, I'll leave bringing the mayonnaise and bread to my colleague, Dr. Walford. Uh, but there has to be, uh, think of Swiss cheese when you go to the store. There are holes in the cheese. No layer is solid, but each layer uh, does prevent, present a barrier against viral infection. And so first we have access to vaccines and therapeutics, and that's a shared responsibility developed and financed by our government uh, and, and researchers. The next layer is support for quarantine and isolation if you have the disease. And that includes getting food, uh, paid medical leave, having insurance for people who, can, who have to stay home to care for themselves and others in the appropriate fashion, and that they stay home and in quarantine or isolation for the appropriate time after a contact. Okay, the next layer is government financial support and regulations and messaging. And we're going up and down on this topic, uh, at least uh, the, the information that we get, but we have to be clear, uh, we need funding. And 
keep in mind when the public health emergency ends October 13th, and if it is not extended, the things that we were getting for our communities without cost may have a cost. So what I'm saying now is get it now while you can, because we don't know what's going to happen after October 13th. Then another layer of shared responsibility is the public buildings in which we go. And that includes schools, libraries, stores, restaurants, uh, that indoor ventilation and filtration uh, is up to par, filters are changed. And of course we say outdoors is best. And then supported by the state, and local communities access to fast and sensitive testing and tracing. And that was the, the first part of our conversation. Uh, testing is most important because then you make decisions on how you will continue to prevent from infecting other people uh, and protect your own health. Then avoiding crowds and unmasked groups because you know we like crowds and you know, it looks exciting on TV when you're watching a baseball game or a basketball game, but ask yourself, is this really the wisest time to be in a crowd of unmasked folks? And then wash your hands and cover your cough and sneeze. And our, we had a, a, a nurse a PhD who's an infection specialist who told us last week, wash your hands and ideally use a, a liquid soap not a common bar of soap, so you don't spread the germs that way. And then wear a mask over your mouth and nose. And nothing frustrates me more than seeing people walking around with their nose out their mask. Why are you even bothering at that point? The virus is transmitted through our exhalation and we get it by inhaling the virus. So you must cover your nose and your mouth properly, and we're saying now the best mask is a KN95 or a 94, but also you can wear a double mask, a double surgical mask. In other words, two masks at one time, and then physical distancing. These are the personal responsibilities. If you feel sick, stay home, get your home test and get tested, uh, put yourself in uh, quarantine. That's if you're if you're definitely sure, uh, or if you have a question that you have an infection. But if you're infected, you you should go into isolation. And ideally, it's you're in a separate area. You're using a separate bathroom. You're not handling food in the kitchen. You're not going to work or school. And so we have to think about these layers of uh, risk protection working together to ensure that we don't have the risk of the complications that Dr. Vega just outlined and the complications of long COVID and the complication of spreading the infection to others. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Reynolds, and it's so important. I know it seems like we're repeating these, but every time there's a little new insight that comes with this message, and so we appreciate you sharing that with us today, and we're going to ask Dr. Wolford if she would like to add some really important things. We don't know if it's coming out of her kitchen or... <laughs> no, no kitchen. No kitchen today. We'll save that for a medical moment. But thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this round table. And thank you so much to Dr. Vega for all of that such important information about the effect of COVID on the brain. I have a couple of questions about that. And I really am so thrilled that Dr. Reynolds emphasized how we can protect ourselves. Because I find there's a lot of conversation currently about, well, why, you know, why bother? We're all going to get COVID anyway. So, you know, we have to live our lives. But I think that we have to think about a few things. One, that we want to survive this pandemic, right? We all want to survive it. But more than surviving, we want to thrive. And we are at risk for not thriving by actually, even if we get a mild case, as Dr. Vega pointed out, we can have these long-term problems or these problems that come up somewhat after the actual acute infection. And so while we may not have something that's so severe initially and we look like, oh, we're surviving it, 
I think that this virus is going to really impact how millions of us, whether or not we thrive as the years go by. And I just think that the information that Dr. Vega shared really highlights that. And then one other point, while we want to survive and thrive, we all do not want to provide a place where the virus can hide. Because when it can hide in us, there we know that's when it does this mutation, the, the, the mutating that we, have, we are so concerned about. And when it mutates in the way that it has now, and now we're at what B, BA5, and then there's the, the even variants beyond that, it finds ways to fight the immunity that we have built up, either by vaccination or through natural infection. All of that immunity, while it still helps, it is not as good at protecting us when we have all of these new variants, all that mutation going on. And so we want to avoid having it in us so it cannot mutate, so we don't have to deal with these new problems. Which gets me to my question of, if now we know we have the new variants, how is that impacting the way in which COVID is affecting you know, our brain? And because it's mutated in so many ways and we're able to, more people are getting reinfected, how, what sort of impact is that having on um, the, the way in which COVID uh, damages our brain? That's a question for you, Dr. Vega. Yeah, so uh, good question. I think that we need to emphasize the success story here and it's vaccination, it's the vaccines. So because the vaccine has provided, a, like I mentioned in the last presentation, the a excellent goalkeeper that prevents the, the virus from scoring on us, uh, it actually has prevented people to develop moderate to severe and to actually attack uh, the epithelium. So it affects uh, or induces the, the process of coagulation that was the basis of the strokes that we saw at the beginning of the pandemics. But still, we are observing people uh, uh, with chief complaints as a loss of taste, a loss of smell, and muscle pain. So even though we are not seeing the hypoxia, the, the, the lack of oxygen and the massive inflammation in the brain, uh, we still seeing that these new, virus, uh, new, new variants are attacking the nervous system. Uh, whether that is, that is enough to actually uh, be at the same risk as at other times in the, pan in the pandemic, we don't know yet. But definitely, the fact that people are not getting, more people are not getting into ICU, it at least give us the hope that less people are going to be a uh, higher risk like at the, in comparison to the beginning of the pandemic. So, so, thank you. Uh, does that get your question answered, Dr. Wilford? It does, it does. I mean, so that we know that it can still impact our nervous system, but we don't know. We always say on this on this webinar that we are learning all the time, yes. new information all the time. So Absolutely. we're gonna find out, I guess, over time, how that impact on the nervous system, what are the long-term results of that, right? And if we get COVID multiple times, multiple mild episodes, does that have more impact on our nervous system over time? I guess we're going to learn that. And so I think it gets to why we really all need to test if we think we're sick, because we do need to do that isolation and we do need to do the quarantine because we do not want to spread it to others so that you know they may have a worse um, outcome than we may be, even if we're safe. We definitely need to do that. And I think we need to wear our masks because that is one thing that no matter what variant it is, a barrier is going to help us avoid getting um, succumbing to the illness. Thank you. And we have one really other quick question. It's in the queue. It's from a woman uh, who has, who's saying that she's 71 years old, currently has tested positive for a mild case, uh, just slight symptoms and is completely vaccinated. Would wonder what the long-term effects would be on her brain. Her mom had dementia when she passed away. Does that increase her chances of, of Alzheimer's? Well, uh, what we know right now is that uh, in terms of probabilities, uh, having a family history 
and in combination with uh, the COVID-19 uh, positivity or developing COVID-19. Uh, in terms of probability, the answer unfortunately will be yes. It will have higher risk. But risk doesn't mean that you are gonna develop the disease. Risk just mean that you are in position to do other things, to, to manage and to reduce that risk. That's in, on your hand. So even though you are at the, uh, above 70 years of age, exercising, diet, and sleeping well, and maintaining good interaction, social interaction, and maintaining cognitive active, meaning doing things, learning new things, interacting with your grandkids, uh, having fun times, all that, uh, despite of the risk, is actually will do something uh, to prevent developing the disease. Uh, analogy that I can use is that you know every time you, you get into your car, you are at risk of an accident. You always are at risk of having an accident once you start driving. But you drive at a speed limit, you put your, your seatbelt, and you do everything possible to follow the, the, the instruction in the road to prevent that accident. The same thing is our health, but we don't think that way. So we can do things to put our seatbelt, to drive in the lane, to do the stop sign, to take the stop sign and stop when we need. And also most important, manage our speed. We need to rest, we need to sleep, uh, we need to relax. Thank you, Dr. Vega. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. And thank you, Dr. Wilford. Good insights for us after such a robust presentation. We appreciate your insights today. And we're going to move now because people are asking, so what's happening here in Flint, Genesee County? And Dr. Rick Sackler is going to give us that update. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Yvonne. So yeah, uh, these are our standard graphs and looking at what's going on in Genesee County, it looks like a fair bit of a jump in the last week, but if you look at it again, looking back farther over time, that kind of smooths out. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, our new cases were nearly as high countywide as they were um, this week. In the city of Flint, we saw a bit of a jump. And so that's concerning. We've got three weeks of increases in Flint, but again, Three weeks ago, the number of new cases was very low. So again, we like to try to put these things in perspective. And um, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, you could remember that we shared a couple different kinds of maps. We were looking at the percentage of a population that has uh, gotten COVID over a certain time period, um, and not just the number of cases in a in a city or a zip code. Uh, and then we also, of course, look at density of cases. But if we look at density of cases, we have to look at density of people and then see, like, where is the actual difference in terms of, like, where are there relatively more people with COVID than we would expect? So when we look at these numbers, there's 357 new cases in Genesee County outside the city of Flint, and there's 101 in the city. However, Genesee County has more than four times as many people as Flint. So for every five people in Genesee County, four of them live outside the city of Flint. And so these numbers, we would actually expect if it was uh, even, Genesee County should have even more cases. So what I'm saying is um, the, uh, actually for this week, the number of cases in Flint is um, slightly disproportionate as compared to the county. So Flint has a little bit more cases than we would expect when we're looking countywide, uh, but and, and also that our positivity rate is fairly high. Um, again, there's all the caveats that we've been hearing over the last few weeks with respect to like there's not as much testing going on, and so we may be missing a lot of cases. But also the cases that we're getting tested positive, it could be that there's a higher percentage rate because a lot of people simply aren't coming out unless they're feeling unwell, coming out for testing, I should say. Uh, I do want to share a couple thoughts on the nationwide picture. I took a look at um, one of my favorite resources, the New York Times COVID map. Uh, and again, this is just to put everything in perspective. We like to look at Flint, Genesee County, and then much broader. So Michigan's actually doing fairly well at the moment. Um, I don't want to certainly don't want to minimize it and say that you know we shouldn't be vigilant. But uh, looking at where cases are highest, you've got uh, Kentucky and West Virginia in a little bit south of here. You've got Florida, Alabama, and South Carolina. 
those five states are among the highest case rates nationwide. Uh, when we look at hospitalizations, West Virginia is toward the top again, also Florida, Missouri, and then Alabama and Georgia. So in both terms of number of cases and hospitalizations, the places in the U.S. that have the highest numbers and the highest rates are south of us. Uh, and all of those places are about twice as severe as Michigan currently is. Uh, and Flint is falling into about the average of Michigan's case rates overall. So all that to say, there's certainly worse places to be this summer with respect to the risk from COVID. Um, but as we know with the BA5 variant, it's more infectious and um, including with reinfection, even if you had COVID a few weeks ago. So uh, although case rates here are lower than they are elsewhere in the US, it's of course a little bit of a different ballgame than we had last year with respect to the, the level of infectiousness. Thank you so much, Dr. He Dr. Sadler. Appreciate that insight and that broader view that you've given us today. And so we want to just simply want to just focus here on uh, what's happening in our local community. And then I've got a few more minutes, so I'm going to ask our roundtable to come back for one last bit of a conversation. So let's hear from our City of Flint representative, Katie. Well, it's great to be here with you. Um, so the first piece of news I have for you is that the CS Mott Foundation has granted $850,000 to the City of Flint to support Flint Police Department's public safety programs. Um, this is money that is designed to be a matching grant for ARPA funds to help make those programs sustainable. Um, and it includes a citywide gun bounty, a cold case resolution unit in the police department, the development of a witness protection program, 24-7 uh, operations for the city of Blitz, um, for the police department's intelligence center, and it also assists with overtime pay for officers. Next slide, please. Uh, Commute yesterday launched, this is a new business based in Flint. They launched a, another Micro mobility charging station at Marketplace Apartments. They have locations around the city. They're still adding more locations. Uh, there's one right on Saginaw Street in front of the U of M Flint Pavilion. Um, so these charging stations, they have electric scooters there that you can rent via the Hellbiz app and ride them around the city. You can also use these stations to charge e bikes, wheelchairs anything smaller than a car. And the vehicle adapter is made from nylon and stainless steel. So it locks your vehicle to the station and it's secure while charging. Now, this company was actually created by Kettering University graduates. Um, the charging stations were designed, manufactured and assembled right here in Flint. So this is a really exciting uh, new business for us to have here. And finally, I'd like to tell you about the Hamilton Dam Removal Project. Uh, this is decades in the making. The federal government has provided funds to help remove the remainder of the dam. Uh, construction will start in 2023. It could take up to two years, um, but this has been a long time coming. So we just wanna congratulate all of our community partners Flint River Watershed Coalition, everyone who's helped make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. And Helen, and if we could go back and just bring our round table team back one more time for us today. Uh, I want to just pose a question for uh, Dr. Reynolds, Dr. Wolford, and Dr. Dr. Um, Vega. These things are changing. And I just want to help have you help uh, help emphasize for us today the ever-changing environment that we're living in as it relates to COVID. I know that we've talked about the one variant and there's more variants coming. So what, what, what recommendation would you give to us as a community about how we address these ever-changing times that we're living in? I'll say as a medical provider, we try to approach this with humility. In other words, uh, what we say today may change and that's the scientific process that's the medical process we have one solution 
And as the situation changes, we improve on those solutions. So it's not that we don't know what we're doing, we're building on what we know to help people stay well. I will add to what Dr. Reynolds says that um, the biology has its own time. And even though we, we want to get out of this pandemic and be back to uh, January 2020 or December 2019, uh, biology in this case, this virus has its own time. And but as Dr. Wolf mentioned before, mask, we're washing your hands, do the things that we have been saying from the very beginning will actually help us to return to a more normal life. Uh, the virus, unfortunately, as people get infected, um, it will find a way to evolve, to change to other variants. And what we need to do is to minimize that uh, infection. So you can put uh, your your grain of sand uh, to to actually stop this to continue evolving. Yeah, and I would just add that there are, um, while this is all of an experiment, while we're learning, I think um, both Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Vega brought up some things that we know that really don't change. We, um, we may learn more and more about how it works, but there's some specifics or some details about our basic health that do not change. And you guys just kept mentioning my kitchen, so I ran up to my kitchen. We know right that one of these things is better for our brain one of these things is better for our health we have to consider that we're training we're training it's not for a sprint it's for a marathon and we have to have our bodies in the best health possible to be able to make it through no matter what the virus throws at us and so i should throw away this i'm going to blame my husband he bought this that's why it's in the house and instead have this and what I don't do, what I like, really want to hear more from Dr. Vega about, and probably in another session, is about sleep. Because I know that's really important, and we don't really give that enough um, attention, I think, when we think about our health. But we need to do those things that we know for sure are going to help protect us no matter what, on top of getting the vaccine and wearing our masks. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate your input and insights today because these are the little tips that we need to take along with us every day. Ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we also recognize that we have to be partakers of the things that we're sharing. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Reynolds, Dr. Wilford, and Dr. Vega. Appreciate you being here today. And we wanna just say for those of you that are social workers and uh, community health workers, remember that you can get those continuing education units for, for community health workers and the contact hours for social workers. So we wanna encourage you to continue to uh, stay on the line a little bit following that so that you can get your credits. And then we want to encourage you to continue to join us uh, on um, our webinar, like us on Facebook at www.facebook.com, HFRCC, or subscribe to our YouTube channel, Healthy Flint, or you can even email us at info at hfrcc.org. We're always interested in your questions, so please continue to send your questions in. Or give us a call at 810-835-2130, and this has been a marvelous day today. We're glad that you joined us, and we look forward to you being back with us again for the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center's community, Flint Community Webinar on Coronavirus. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.